Uh, we're live. I had some internet problems and some, uh, had to reboot my computer. So I'm late. I'm sorry. I hope you still come in. Um, we were just running a little bit late. And um, we're going to pray and get started. Father, I ask you to be with us right now as we uh, as we go into our Bible study. I ask you to calm me down and allow me to focus on the things you would have us to do and bring in people, even though we're a few minutes late, on the people that were planning to be here. Tina's here. Do we sound okay? And so, Father, I ask you to bless us and guide us through this time. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry I'm late, Tina. Hi, Tina Lee. Do we sound okay? I think I do. I think I do. Okay. Hopefully I do. So, um, happy Memorial Day. Uh, came in and my computer was locked up. Okay, thanks. I'm glad we do. All right. So we prayed. We're in Romans chapter 8, verse 9. We'll quickly run through. The chapter to this point. Hey, Michael, thank you for um, having patience. I was running a little late, had some computer issues here today. We got them straightened out. Nothing that a good reboot won't do. So, so Father, I ask you to bless this time, and I thank you for that. And I, and I pray that we, we get to focus right now, and I thank you for those who come in. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, um, really weird. Everything was working when I left, but um, that was a few days ago. So, all right, so we're in uh, Romans 8 9, and um, let's see, Romans 8 1, well, we'll look at the last few verses. He says, uh, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That's Romans 8, 6, he says, Because the carnal mind is at enmity against God, it's not even subject to the law of God, nor can it be, indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh, remember we talked last time, that in the flesh is a way of saying lost, in the spirit is uh, a way of saying saved. There's only two kinds of people in the world, people who are in the spirit, very small percentage of any humans at any one given time is born again. And the majority, almost everybody else, is uh, lost, and they're in the flesh. In verse 9, it's just the verse we're in now. He, said, he had just said that about being in the flesh and being in the spirit. In verse 9, he says this, the Apostle Paul does. Let me copy it and paste it, since there's nobody here to help me. Um, it says, but you, speaking to born-again people, remember he wrote this to the believers who are in Rome, both Jews and Greeks, and now he's writing it to us, the believers. And if you're not a believer yet, maybe you will be uh, paying attention to a study like this. But um, so, so he's talking to believers, and he says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, since or if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not, he is not his, with a capital H. Or if anyone does not belong, have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to Jesus, right? And so that's what he's saying. Now, the word dwells in this verse. He says, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. <clears throat> the word dwells is a word which describes how a person lives in a house and because they live there, they're welcome to roam about in all of its rooms. The Holy Spirit feels welcome to search out every part of a human. Indeed, this is God the Spirit's right. We are his house. And so, uh, why do we say that? Why do we say we are God's house? Well, I'll show you a verse out of Hebrews chapter 3, verses 5 to 6, in which he says this. Remember, the book of Hebrews, if, if you didn't study it with us, the book of Hebrews was, was written by someone. We're not positive who it was. Some people think Paul. Some people think Apollos. There's all kinds of people 
that uh, some people think Ananias from Ananias and Sapphira did it. We really don't know because the writer doesn't identify himself. All we know is that he wrote, whoever wrote this wrote in a high level of Greek because there was a formal Greek and a, and a um, like everyday Greek like there is in German. There's a formal German and everyday German. Uh, even in Spanish, that's the case. Paul, the Apostle Paul tended to write in everyday uh, Hebrew or Greek. Well, this was written to the Hebrews in Greek, and it's written in the, the more formal version, so po possibly not Paul. Or it could be that Paul dictated it or Paulus dictated it, and uh, whoever wrote it was familiar with, with the uh, formal version of Greek. But at any rate, it's written to to encourage Jews who are about to start coming under some kind of opposition from people like Paul um, to, to, um, to not go back to Judaism, to continue on with, with uh, Jesus. And so he says, but you are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit. This is Romans 8 and 9. Um, Indeed, the spirit of God dwells in you. And then I said, you are his house. Well, look what he says in Hebrews 3, verses uh, 5 and 6. He says, And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterwards. So he was the testimony of things that were going to come. But Christ as a son over his own house, we are, whose house we are, since indeed we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. We are his house because we hold fast to the confidence. Hold fast to the confidence. Grab a hold of it and never let it go. And rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Remember, everything on the earth is designed by the devil to trip us up and to cause us to not have hope in Christ. It caused us to not rejoice in the hope and not hold fast to the confidence that we have. He says, but you are his house. And I think that's beautiful. I wonder if sometimes if we, as the house of God, live in such a way as to make the Holy Spirit feel welcome in us. Do we live in such a way where he feels welcome? Hey, Joe Yarbrough, it's been a little bit. It's good to see you, my friend. Um, it's really good to see you. I'm happy to see you here. But I wonder if we, as the house of God, live in such a way as to make the Holy Spirit to feel welcome in us. Are we wide open to him? Or do we, as so many do, try to have like rooms in ourselves in which we try to hide things from God? I also wonder why we call a man-made building with the steeple on top, or maybe without, why we call it the house of God and expect people to act a certain way in that man-made building when all the while, according to the scriptures, every single born-again person in that building is themselves the house of God, the house of Christ. We will still be the house of Christ when that person walks out and goes on with his daily life. Or does he stop? You know, that's, that's the problem with uh, making a, sign, a, a signifying a building to be the house of God where every one of us is the place where the Holy Spirit indwells us and lives in us as in a house. The danger of taking special buildings and requiring special behavior in those buildings causes us to not think that we need to practice those behaviors when we leave the buildings. You know, I had a friend came in from another state and here in Texas, there's a lot of cowboys and cowboys will often wear the hats in church or they wear baseball caps. You know, uh, farmers will wear baseball caps and it, it enraged my friend. And he said, why are they wearing hats in church? And I said, boy, they are the church and wherever they go is the church. What's the difference? There's a lot of cowboys that will take their hat off, put it on the floor under a pew in church. I've seen that a lot. Why do we feel pressure to act one way 
quote, at church, unquote, hi Liz, and, and feel free to live like hell the rest of the time when we are really 24-7 the house of God. Why do we feel that way? Because religion, which was also man-made, like those buildings, places deceptive restraints on people. So back to Romans 8 and 9, he says, But you are not in the flesh, since indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, and I'm just going to paraphrase the end of the verse, he doesn't belong to God. Now, this is one of those places in which reading a single verse as if it was a standalone verse might mislead the reader. It is always important to read the scriptures in the context of what falls before it and what falls after it. For instance, what if we took the term Spirit of Christ to refer to how a person conducts himself? You know, there's a lot of people that say, "Are you are you behaving in the spirit of Christ? Are you being are you being good?" You know that kind of thing. What if we took that turn to refer to their behavior? Well, one commentator addresses this, and he's one of my favorites. He's Albert Barnes, and I'm going to quote the whole quote there, so you can mull over it later if you want, or you can copy it and paste it if you do that. He says this, the word spirit is often used to denote the temper, disposition. Thus we say a man of a generous spirit or of a revengeful spirit, etc. It may possibly have that meaning here and denotes that he who has not the temper or disposition of Jesus of Christ is not his or has no evidence of piety. But the connection seems to demand in other words, in context, that it should be understood in a sense similar to the expression of the Spirit of God and the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, Romans 8, 11. And if so, it means the Spirit which Christ imparts or that sends to accomplish his work, John fourteen twenty six, The Holy Spirit sent to make us like Christ and to sanctify our hearts. So you get the difference between those. There are a whole lot of people that will watch our behavior, and a lot of us will do it to ourselves, and will pay attention to our behavior and decide, because I'm not behaving specifically pious right now, I wonder if I'm still saved. You know, and I, I don't think there's any point in that. I think that, that the whole religion, whole denominations have been built on the idea that we might not be like Christ because we don't always behave with them. But what this scripture is talking about in context is whether or not indeed the very Holy Spirit of God dwells inside us, not contingent on our behavior. So Mike, Michael, um, Michael says, Karen and Michael here, these are my friends that we met a few weeks ago as they came through town. Had a bit of trouble finding you this evening, but we're here coming in clear. Michael, I was seven minutes late because of computer problems. I'm sorry. Um, so back to Romans 8 and 9. So based on the context, it's definite that the term the Spirit of Christ here refers to the being who is God, the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it is right that in the scripture there, it be capitalized. And so I'm going to paste it again out of Romans 8 and 9. We're going to go a little bit late tonight because we start a little bit late because of my fun computer, which I am seriously considering getting a new one uh, because bargain me. Okay, uh, so, but if you are, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, since indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. What Paul says here is pretty sobering, but so true. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And the point Paul is making here has to do with whether or not God literally owns a born-again person. And his point is that God owns believers. 
We belong to him. Not in a not in a simplistic or um in some kind of symbolic sense. We belong to him. We are his property. We have pledged ourselves to him and we asked him to purchase us. So let's look at a verse out of the New American Standard, first Peter chapter two, verse nine in which the Apostle Peter says something that coincides with what Paul's saying here. He says, you, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. This is a verse worth writing down and putting on the mirror and when you brush your teeth or brush your hair or comb your teeth or comb, whatever it is you do, um, you, you read this verse out loud to yourself because there's a whole bunch of us that don't feel particularly chosen. There's a bunch of us in the body of Christ that don't feel like we're royal priests, yet the scripture says we are. A whole bunch of us because we scrutinize our behavior and we let that define us or our thoughts even transient thoughts that come through our mind and we go I'm not holy because I had these unholy thoughts but what Peter says is you are speaking to born again people you are a holy nation you are a people for God's own possession we belong to Jesus why so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light there's a purpose for this. God knew that simply causing us to be born again wasn't going to be enough for people to receive. So he, there's a lot that happens the moment we get saved. And one of them is we, we become transformed from people of darkness into people of light. He says that, in, in, I think in Ephesians chapter 4, he says that specific thing. Um, we become a royal priesthood. We have the right, according to Hebrews, to boldly go into the king, the throne of grace. Why? Because we're welcome there, because we're royal priests. We are a holy nation. We're a, God for God, a people for God's own possession. Now, how did that come to be? Especially given that most people, they think they belong to themselves, especially in, in America and in the first world. A lot of the Western world believes, well, I, I, I belong to me. I don't belong to anybody else. I can do whatever I want. Even born-again people feel that way. And you know you can. You can do whatever you want. It'll hurt you if you don't do it according to who you are in Christ. But we're free. We're free to sin. We're free to obey the Lord. So how, do, how did that happen? How did this come to be when most humans believe they belong to themselves? What's well, because we ask for it? We have we ask for this to happen the day we confess Jesus as Lord. So look at this verse out of First Corinthians six. He says, "Do you not know that your body is the temple, the house of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, who's the Spirit you have, and you're not your own." Why? Because you were bought at a price. Jesus paid a high price to purchase every one of us. That's why we have so much value. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which belongs to God's, which are God's, apostrophe S. Not God, plural. We are not God's. We are belong to God's. At that point, you know, when I was doing prison ministry, um, and even before that, um, we would go into a prison or I would be in a counseling room and I'd be sharing the gospel with someone that wasn't born again and I would share it with them. And one of the things that I, they wanted us to do in prison ministry was cover as many prisoners as we could in a two and a half day period. We were there for 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day for Friday and Saturday and then half a day on Sunday. And, and the goal was to give everybody a chance to uh, hear the gospel at least once and make a decision about whether they wanted to receive uh, God or not, you know, and um, there were people there that were going as fast as they could. They were trying to collect as many names as they could. 
Well, I was on a team that, that night, on uh, Saturday night, we would tally up, like, who rededicated, who prayed, who wanted prayer, who received the Lord for the first time, so that we can have some idea of, of what our, um, the best you can, not being able to read, you know, x-ray hearts, um, how many people, how, how productive were we, you know? And um, it became evident to me after the first time I did that, that a lot of people were just praying as fast as they can. They they weren't taking the time to explain what was happening, they, and and so I I don't I don't know how many people obey an altar call in the body of Christ in a church building or at a rally, or in somebody's house church, and really don't have a clue about what they're getting into. You know, I went to lead a Vietnamese lady to Christ once, and I I went to back. Well, I thought she had prayed and received the Lord, and I was in use in the baptizer and. And I said, so from this point on, you belong to Jesus. And she said, I can't be a Buddhist anymore. Because I don't know if you know this, but in, often in the, in the uh, Vietnamese culture, because the French were in, in um, Asia for so long, and Vietnam for so long, a lot of people practice both Catholicism, in which you really never ask to be born again, and, and uh, Buddhism. And I watch with my own eyes people being led by a priest out of a Catholic church in the eastern part of New Orleans where you know I lived for a long time and pass all these Vietnamese Catholics off to the Buddhist um, monk to go do Buddhist services, whatever it is they do. And so now they were Buddhist, you know. And, and so I asked that. She goes, I, I can't be Buddhist? I said, no. Um, Jesus is going to spend his suffering and his blood to purchase you. How much of you will he own? And she goes, I don't know. And I said, he'll own all of you. And I said, so Buddha won't. <laughs> and she went, I didn't know that. And I said, well, let's think about it. I'm not in a rush. You know, and, and she wound up, I think, I think, didn't she? Didn't she? I think she was born again that night and received Jesus as the Lord. But as long as she thought she could straddle two worlds, well, heck, she'd be like a lot of born-again people that think they can do whatever they want and it never hurt them. And it's just not true. So we asked Jesus, we confessed him as our Lord, as our owner, and he bought us at a price. And at that point, Jesus honored our request, purchased us, how much? Our entirety. He purchased our past, our present, our future, our hopes, dreams, anything that we would hang the word mine on, he purchased. It now belongs to him. I still had children. I still, we still owned a house. We still owned vehicles, still had computers and all that kind of stuff. Well, I think all those things belong to the Lord. And he allows us to take care of it. So let's take good care of our stuff, our stuff. Because it's not our stuff, it's his stuff. This isn't our life. And that's why if he calls you to do something, I think we should do it. If he, pull, if he draws you in to something, if he draws you into a relationship, into a, a, a job, into a going to another country to live, moving from New Orleans to Houston and from Houston to North Texas like we did, then we do it because we don't belong to ourselves. And here's the good thing about it. If nothing belongs to you, who can control you with fear and anxiety? Nobody. If we are being controlled by fear, anxiety, doubt, shame, it's because we think something belongs to us and we should make an inventory of that. We have ways to do that through our ministry to help people do that and surrender those things to Jesus and get you some relief. He says, come to me, all who are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Come to me with your belt, with your heavy things you're carrying. Um, one way to be exhausted is to be anxious all the time. One way to be exhausted is to be afraid all the time or to be in doubt all the time. Or to worry all the time. I think the Lord wants us to um, be anxious for nothing, he says in several places. 
So, so Jesus did this. He purchased us and he gave us the Spirit of Christ. In, in, in Romans 8 and 9, in the last part of that verse, it says, Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. Paul is making the point that lost people do not have the Spirit of Christ. And that born again people do have the Spirit of Christ. And he's, he's making this point not as a static point that's just sitting in the scripture as a standalone idea. He's making this point so he can lead into the next verse and into the ideas of the next verse. This is why it's important that we don't cherry pick the scriptures and just like quote one without reading the ones around it. And you can see how I'm teaching it. I refer back, I refer forward, and then I refer across scriptures to you know, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, wherever similar ideas are to show the fabric of these ideas. It's not just Paul's idea. This is Peter's idea too. It's not Peter and Paul's idea. This is the Holy Spirit who has inspired them to write these things. So let's look at Romans 8.10. So we've hurtled all the way through another verse. From verse 8 to verse 9 to verse 10. Yay! Look at us go. We're making tracks, baby. So, um, so this is verse 10. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. And I think it's very important to see how Paul frames these sentences. If he's truly writing as inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, I'm, I'm pretty sure the Holy Spirit of God has a really good grasp of every language there ever was and ever will be. So he's having them write exactly what he means. And if just, just as an aside, if you read anything I write, whether it be a Proverbs word or these Bible studies, or and I put an article out the other day. You can go to the articles link that I'm going to post later. And it's the first article there because it's the newest article there. It's called Do Something um, to, to, to encourage us to not live a passive life and to live a life of active faith in Christ. Um, every word I write is specifically chosen. That's why it takes so long to write. I worked Friday, Saturday, and Sunday not all the time, but for hours. And I think I produced three pages of this Bible study because I'm in no rush, but I want to be specific and I want to be intentional and I want to hear what Christ wants to write through me, through his spirit. What would happen if we mowed our lawn that way, if we shopped that way, if we parented that way, if we worked at our jobs that way, if we drove in traffic that way, if we uh, spoke from a pulpit, or if we took notes in a seat that way, or if we spoke at a house gathering where you're free to, to teach just like everybody else, what would happen if we did that? I think this, this Christian life would be so much more exciting than uh, punching in and punching out a couple of times a week. He says, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. And one reason it's so important that we read the Word of God in context. Hi, Joyce. So good to see you, Joyce Mullins. This is one reason why it's so important that we read the Word of God in context and not as if every verse was a standalone point or a standalone thought. We must see what comes before and after a verse to get the true spirit a little, a little spirit pun there. A little, the true spirit of what's being said. So we can get what his train of thought is. Because he didn't just write a letter for his own amusement. He wrote, his letter, wrote this letter for a purpose. So he can prep these people to help them grow. To help them be everything they could in the Lord. He says, and if Christ is in you. The body is dead because of sin. The word if, two things to see initially here. The word if can also mean since. 
In this case, it means since. Therefore, it's a given due to us being saved and not as tenuous as if might sound in the English. And so read it that way. And since Christ is in you. Why? Because he just said in the verse before, um, well, two verses before, well, where was that? Um, in verse 8, no, verse 9, he says, you are not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit. So in verse 9, he said that. Here he says, since Christ is in you, because he's talking to people where there's no doubt the Holy Spirit of God is, is in you. No matter what we've been taught, no matter what you've been taught. And think about this tonight before you go to sleep. However you were taught, the scripture says that when you received Jesus as Lord, the Holy Spirit came to dwell in your human spirit. Sometimes it's taught differently. The second thing to see here initially is that many Christian, many groups within what I'll call Christendom, the big, big, wide, flung, all the different splits of, of the, the one church, um, many groups within Christendom tend to downplay the Holy Spirit, and mostly that's because to, of some of the excesses of what I call charismania. I, I believe in charismatic approach to the scriptures. I don't think it's sinful. I don't think it's weird. But charismania is. And there's a lot of maniac ideas in both the cessationist church and the charismaniac church. These groups often call cessationist because they believe the Holy Spirit is either in a, is either sort of in you or that he dwells in Christians to the degree that they memorized the Bible. That's what I was taught in the church I was born again in. And this cannot be true because it would mean that the presence of the Holy Spirit in a person's life would be due only to that person's works or ability to memorize. And God doesn't operate like that. For instance, do you believe that a mentally challenged person can't be born again do you believe that the Holy Spirit of God won't live in that person because he or she can't think the way a person who's not mentally challenged? What about a person who's had a, um, a head injury? Does that disqualify them from being filled with the Holy Spirit of God? I don't believe so. And so what happens is because on the, on the side of safety, because some people are excessive and do things that are weird in the charismatic church, some of the people in the non-charismatic church just tend to downplay the Holy Spirit of God. It's like he's on some kind of uh, vacation somewhere and not really doing much anymore because, you know, Gutenberg printed a Bible. I don't believe that, I don't think God was waiting for the printing press to flick the switch in the Holy Spirit and say, you can stand down now. Or for the last apostle, original apostle to die. I don't believe that's true. So he says, since Christ is in you, Christ is in you. That's the way it is. I think that's something worth investigating if you're not sure. How do you harvest the benefits of that if you just won't believe it? Because of fear, or because of bad teaching, or because of whatever. A denominational stance. He says, since Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. And why does it say that? It's really hard to read that, isn't it? Because we have bodies. What does it mean that the Bible says the body is dead because of sin? Now, I've read a number of possible explanations of this idea, and there's only two that seem clear and make sense to me, so I'm going to share them here. The first has to do with the fact that due to the fall of man and restriction from the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, all people physically die. And that's going to be true for all of us unless Jesus shows up again before we quit breathing. Where do we get that idea? Well, it comes out of Hebrews 9, verse 27. It's appointed for man once to die. So we're going to die. Now, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, in third, no, wow. 
I think it's um wow let me look this up really quick um, uh, I put this in my notes it's third Corinthians I don't think there is one in him that we know of second second Ooh, uh, wow! Am I uh, am I uh, embarrassed? Uh, Paul said in Second Corinthians five one that we live in an earthly tent, our bodies. In other words, our bodies are subject to the second law of thermodynamics. Thermodynamics, everything on the earth eventually degrades and falls apart. In other words, we are mortal, so physical death is a part of earthly life. Oh, I just want to pause just for a second. The, um, the reason I said that we don't know if there's a third Corinthians letter is that there is a theory among scholars that the first Corinthians letter is the first one, that there was a second letter to the Corinthians that's been lost and not found yet, and that there's a third Corinthians which we call second Corinthians. I wish I could say that's why I put three Corinthians there, but the re reason I did is because it was a typo. It was a boo-boo. So, uh, sorry about that. Um, so, we're mortal. And so, physical death is part of that. The second way to look at this idea of the body being dead because of sin is to ponder how the power of sin actually works in our lives. And we talked earlier, I think it was in, in, um, in, ver in chapter 7, that the power of sin dwells within us. And we talked about it then. But not everybody was in the study then, so we're going to kind of revisit that. Having been born without the presence of the Holy Spirit of God in our human presence, we have been susceptible to the suggestions and guidance of the devil since our first moments outside the womb. And I often say, and not without sadness, that Satan has discipled, and I picked that word on purpose, every human being to ever have been born, except one, except Jesus, and the reason he didn't disciple Jesus, although he tried, uh, was because his human spirit was alive. He had the Holy Spirit of God dwelling inside. Though Satan did try to influence the Lord Jesus through temptation. So we have this verse out of Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, this passage that um, is worth knowing about. For we do not have, on seeing then, we, we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of Christ. Let us hold fast to our confession. He was, of course, unsuccessful. For, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, um, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, I referenced this earlier, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So Jesus understands what it's like for us to be tempted. And so in Romans he says, and if Christ, since Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, when the devil tempts us, when the devil tempts us, especially successfully when he tempts us successfully the memory of that happening is stored in our brains which are a part of our bodies right so let's marinate in that idea for a while so that sin resides in our brains because we remember it we know how to do it it's like having muscle memory to play a sport or to play the piano or to do a job. It's there. It's live. It can influence us. It can exert itself on us and cause us to decide things and do things. Our body is dead then because the sin which is stored in our brains brings death along with it. Death to our lifestyle. Praise God that is not the end of the story. So here in Romans 8.10, the last part of the verse, 
he says this. Let me paste that in there again so we can have it right in front of us. And since Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Since Christ is in us, so is the spirit of God. The spirit of Christ. And that spirit literally is life. The life of God. Isn't it beautiful? Just as the sin in our bodies is the cause of death in our beings, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit himself, brings life. Why? Because of righteousness. So, we're going to wrap this up for tonight in just a couple minutes. But I want to quote out of Matthew Henry's commentary on the whole Bible. That's the name of his book. Not just parts of the Bible. Matthew Henry... Um, really good resource too. I don't use a lot of his because a lot of times he's so um, wordsy, but um, this time it really hits nail on the head. He says, The righteousness of Christ imputed to them, to us, secures the soul, the better part from death. The righteousness of Christ is inherent in them, in us. The renewed image of God upon the soul. Um, Taisa, we uh, will get in touch with you after this, but right now we're in the middle of a Bible study. We'll pray for you and your baby. Um, I, I want to recommend that you reach out to somebody in your area right now. There's a hundred churches around wherever you are. So I ask you to do that. Um, and we'll pray for you in just a second. So, um, the righteousness of Christ imputed to them, to us, secures a soul, the better part from death, the righteousness of Christ inherited in them, in us, the renewed image of God upon the soul preserves it, and by uh, God's ordination at death elevates it and improves it. It improves our soul, and it makes it meet to partake of the inheritance of the saints in light. We get that. The internal life of the soul consists in the vision and fruition of God and both assimilating for which the soul is qualified by the righteousness of sanctification. I suppose the moral here is that Jesus brings a lot to our lives in addition to the right to go to heaven after we physically die. We're going to pick up here next time. So uh, what we're going to do right now is we're going to pray. I, I'm sorry if I'm not saying your name right, but I, I've never seen that name before, Taisha. So, Father, we ask that you give Taisha hope. Uh, I ask that you um, touch somebody's heart to give her a call. Uh, someone in her area that can physically really minister to her. I ask that you uh, bless her. And her little baby. And I know there's got to be somebody that loves her that she can reach out to uh, that would be more efficient than reaching out to us because we are strangers. I ask you to bless her and give her peace. And I ask you to, um, to give her hope. And I thank you for that. Father, I ask that all the people who watch this um, um, in... in um, uh, watch this now, or watching it now, or watching it later, can have hope too, and we'll also pray for Taisha. Um, and I ask you to bless us, Father, as we move on to the next thing. Taisha, I want to uh, encourage you to never post your phone number on social media. Um, anybody can can um, send me a private message and do that. So after I'm done this study, and then I do a radio show next. I'm going to delete this off of here, but I took a picture of it. And if someone else doesn't let me know they called you um, before an hour from now, um, then we will. But um, but it, I, I'm, I'm curious. Um, uh, where are you located? Um, 
Anyway, um, so uh, be play, praying for her and her child. I don't know the child's baby or the gender of the child. Um, I think Taisha is a female name. So, um, and it's her baby, so, so it most likely is a girl. Um, so, um, I want to remind you that you can always go to this link. Um, um, let me find it. You can always go to this link. Um, And all our videos are connected there. Um, Taisha might not even be in the channel anymore. Um, um, if you are Taisha, just type something here, please. Um, this is uh, all our last week. Well, not last week, but the week before last week, I was ill, so I didn't teach. Um, this this uh, is a list of all. This goes to our YouTube channel. So you can always go um, there and see a whole bunch of videos. You can also go to this. My new article is there right now. If you want a link to that, you can go to that. And then if you are uh, somebody that's a fan of the um, radio show that we do or one of the others that others do, you can go to this link on social media, on your phone, on your laptop, or whatever it is you have. And we'll be on there in 10 minutes on um, the Discipleship for Life show. My wife Lori is here, and she's going to be uh, co-hosting it with me tonight. My favorite person, my esteemed co-host. We're going to be looking at a topic called in Receiving Instruction. And uh, we want uh, you to call in if, you, if you're interested um, to call in to... Uh, and we'll announce the the phone number on the show. Um, and so, if you if you're interested in doing that, um, you can be on the show too. Uh, ask a question, or you can um, let me see if I got the number here handy. Nine three nine three five six five four. Here it is. So you can call that number and you can be on the air. And so um, we're going to be moving on down there to the worldwide headquarters of uh, TruthSeekerTexasRadio.com, which is 20 steps away from where I'm sitting right now. Thank you for coming. Um, I don't know who's here. I know I know um, several of y'all are. Michael Bol Bo Bo Bogos here. Uh, Joyce Mullins is here. Um, Liz is here, Joe, um, Tina's here, and uh, really, that's all I know. Maybe Taisha's still here. We'll see, won't we? All right. I love you guys. I'll see you next time. Be praying for that young lady um, in case she really is struggling, that, um, that we'll be able to help her or somebody will be able to help her. All right. I love you. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.